am a young climate ambassador from the project that was going on um, organized from both the British Embassy and the non-governmental organization Go Green in our country. And we're gathered here today to, um, in the name of the, let's say the holiday that was two days ago, to discuss about women and about their role in society. So we're here today with uh, three very influential women and we will raise the issue of uh, gender and climate change. Uh, I'm really happy to hear from our honored guests today about the key issues according to them and about their experiences with the same. So I wouldn't take much time. I will simply just shortly introduce our three panelists today. Um, first of all, we have Robin Maudsley. She is, um, She's joining us here today um, directly from uh, the COP26 unit in the cabinet office. She is actually the gender focal point under the UNFCCC in the United Kingdom. Uh, so welcome, Robin. Next, we have Maria Ristaska. She is the founder and the executive director of the Center for Research and Policymaking in our country. Uh, she also has a lot of experience working at United Nations Women as a gender and public policy expert and analyst. And last but not least, we have Sofia Getova. She is the co-founder and president of the nonprofit organization, which I believe that everyone knows called Collective Z. And I think that they have shown, uh, they have done a great job building capacities, campaigning, and especially educating the young people about environmental and social justice. Uh, welcome to all three of you. And I wouldn't take much, much of your time because this panel discussion in the following hour, I will ask some pretty interesting questions, which I believe that all the participants would like to, would like to hear your opinion, your experience on these topics. So first, uh, I would give the floor to you, maybe shortly introduce yourself in a couple of questions, uh, tell us something about yourself, and maybe maybe tell a story, tell your story about how your beginning in this world of women echo activism looked like. Why did you and how did you enter this realm? Maybe we can start with Robin, then go to Maria and uh, Sofia. Um, great, thank, thank you so much um, for that uh, introduction um, and, and thanks very much to the, um, to the British Embassy for, for organising um, this event. I'm really, really excited to, to be here. Um, so so as, as you said, um, I, I work in the COP unit in, in Cabinet Office and I, um, I work on um, gender and uh, inclusion and kind of public engagement um, as, as those things relate to um, like international climate negotiations. So um, at, at the kind of last COP that you know we had um, a long time ago now, um, we, we negotiated a, a, gender, a gender action plan, which is essentially kind of um, a guide on how countries should address gender equality in their, in their climate action. So I spend lots of my time um, thinking about how to translate that kind of international kind of guidance and, and plan to a domestic context and how we can um, integrate it into what we're doing on, on COP26. Um, and I'm really, really committed in, in terms of my work to making sure that like gender equality and inclusion are, are reflected in um, all our work on, on COP. Um, and I, I feel like I ended up here um, working on gender um, by like, a happy accident, I guess. Um, uh, definitely something that I um, had been uh, interested in for, for a long time. And I was, I was fortunate to, to get a job in the COP unit, which um, allowed me to kind of focus on like, gender equality and inclusion. So um, not a very not a very long story to tell you about my my origins um, and background working on on gender, but um, but yeah, that's that's me. Great to be here. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, being the senior here, <laughs> I must say that uh, first I became um, a feminist and then uh, an eco activist. Uh, I became a feminist rather late because I consider myself a rather um, privileged uh, woman. 
I was raised by two equal parents uh, who have equal roles in their in uh, their household in our family. Uh, and uh, I married um, a professor of liberal theory who is a feminist himself. So I did not feel that uh, women are, you know, have different um, treatment at all uh, until I give birth to this lady uh, behind me. She's already 15 years old and she came to listen because I, I told uh, her that uh, she's, um, uh, that this is actually an event that might be interesting for her. Um, uh, so 15 years ago, I gave birth to Theodora and uh, this is where I became aware that women are not equal uh, uh, as men because uh, outside of my family, uh, in the community where I, um, where I lived and uh, with people who I communicated, worked with, they started asking me, um, who is uh, uh, tending your child, who is taking care of your child while you're doing, um, for example, trainings on weekends. And I would ask my husband whether he would get the same uh, questions because he would do on weekends also trainings. He would never get uh, those questions uh, himself, although he was a young father uh, himself. So this is when I realized that we are not equal, that uh, we are um, actually I expected different things. We have different roles in society, although maybe not in your own family, but that's an exception. Uh, and I started looking through gender lenses, all the research and um, policy work that I have done uh, since then. So for 15 years now, I uh, am including gender perspective in all my policy research and analysis work. and. Um, uh, I have done quite a lot also on climate change uh, and energy and uh, industry uh, participation of women in uh, in these areas. But um, uh, as an eco activist, I um, uh, there is little uh, known about me as an eco activist. But I'm a founder, one of the founders of the uh, Vozduh Sega uh, and uh, the. Those are very active Facebook uh, groups uh, that are uh, actually mobilizing people um, uh, towards um, uh, uh, air quality improvement in the municipality where I was uh, raised and uh, still live and I'm raising my family. Uh, which was rather successful in uh, uh, pushing for uh, several policy um, uh, initiatives and uh, also decisions uh, that uh, led to, uh, to an improvement of the air quality in the municipality. Still, there is a lot of uh, to be done, uh, but uh, I'm very happy that I'm part of that movement as well. Thank you. That was a very interesting uh story let's say hello from me and thank you for having me here well um i am sofia from collective z where uh, together we are currently uh, creating um, and planning and organizing for building a collective response to all the interlinked crises that are happening all around us and we are um with collective visioning method we are um, we, we are building uh, a new vision for our societies and also for system transformation. Why we started is because it's an exciting moment and about the time to start the conversations focused on uh, creating a, a better and healthy planet and communities and doing this including gender equality uh, and uh, including the gender equality in our work is a key in doing so. And this is because all the structural inequalities and injustices that are around us are deeply embedded in the social, economic and political systems that were built from the exploitations of the marginal groups of people, especially women and women from underrepresented communities, girls, LGBTQI plus people. Um, also, uh, when I, if I talk about my beginnings, I would say that uh, by being introduced to the intersectionality approach that explains uh, the system um, inequalities that I mentioned. Um, so the intersectionality as being a concept uh, introduced by 
Kimberly Crenshaw, an African-American feminist in 1989, uh, who explained how different forms of power and systemic oppressions interact on multiple and often simultaneous levels. And this study of overlapping identities uh, is used in critical theories to understand the social inequalities um, and describes the ways in which oppressive institutions, such as uh, gender bias, racism, uh, classicism, and others are interconnected and it cannot be examined separately from one another. And also how the gender that we are given by birth will also determine how we are affected by the systemic oppression. Yes, I, I, I definitely agree. And what I wanted to say before I go on to the next question is that when I see um, young people, especially women, uh, being so passionate and uh, raising their voice about such such important issues, it, it really it's really inspiring for me personally. And I, I really I'm 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 praising you for the job that you have been doing that you're doing, and I hope that you will have a lot of much bigger success in the future because it's definitely needed, especially in our country, in my opinion. And um, I think that the first question that I would ask you is. In your opinion, why do you think that women are being affected more than men by climate change in today's world? Should I go first? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so firstly, I would like to say that the climate change, um, nowadays we want to say it's the climate crisis, uh, is rooted in the systemic inequalities that I mentioned before and is generated by the sy system of patriarchy, capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, and so on. So for instance, the patriarchal and gendered norms that are much present in our country and also at our homes, uh, at, at our work and in public spaces are being reinforced in, and evidenced by everything from uh, the surge of dom domestic violence to the loss of income and livelihoods of women. And most importantly, the increases in women's burden of unpaid care work and unpaid housework. So um, it is likely that the economic, health, environmental and social impact of this crisis will be felt for years to come as well and will affect women. Most importantly, women from underrepresented communities disproportion disproportionately on, on a much larger scale. Also, I would like to uh, now say uh, how the fight for today's climate crisis and for bodily autonomy, the right to govern governance over our own bodies, specifically for women, non-binary and trans people are linked. For example, the toxic chemicals that pollute our water, pollute our air and uh, the land, ge land jeopardize are affecting our health including the reproductive health, often with a disproportionately impact on the women and again, uh, women from affected and underrepresented communities. And um, if I um, could just kind of follow follow on from what you said um, and kind of what you were saying um, in your introduction about, about intersectionality and it being really important to um, in addition to like acknowledging that um, women and girls are disproportionately impacted by climate change, um, also really important to to know that essentially like climate change Im impacts those who are kind of already most marginalized the, the most. So so of course that means women and girls, but it also means um, people with disabilities or indigenous people or or the very, very young or the very old um, or people living in, in poverty, and it's it's people who experience kind of intersecting vulnerabilities who who are likely to be like particularly badly impacted so when we're thinking about how we res respond to climate change it's, it's really important to, to kind of keep that in mind um, and just in terms of um I'm, I'm sure you you all already know this um uh but in terms of the reasons why why this is the case as, as you kind of touched on um Sophia it's it's partly to do with kind of social cultural factors. So um, in, in some societies, there's kind of traditional roles and societal expectations about how women should behave and kind of perform. Like women might 
not be able to leave a house without kind of a male chaperone in some cultures and um, women might be required to look after young children or be pregnant women might not have been taught how to swim or maybe kind of required to wear kind of certain clothing and um, which restricts their ability to like physically react to um, a disaster and um, women women often um have kind of roles um that are, are really dependent on, on natural resources so for example in, in, in some countries they'd be the, the kind of um they would typically collect water for example so so when when there are water shortages they are having to walk further and um, which puts them at, at risk um, and also kind of takes time away from like other things that they could be doing like going to school or or working to get a bit of independence um in a different way and i think i think also kind of the last the last point i'll make is that um access to resources um is is like differentiated so um women are less likely to be e like easily able to access like credit um, they might not have the same rights to land, they might not be part of the same conversations where information on how to respond to disasters is being shared, um, and, and all of those things make it harder to um, adapt and respond to, to climate change. So it's, it's really, really, really important when thinking about climate action to consider all of those things and, and kind of come up with solutions that are, are gender responsive. Okay, this is a great introduction and I will give some data to the facts uh, and trends that uh, Sophia and Robin very well actually uh, depicted and uh, that for Macedonia is, uh, for example, um, women are spending uh, three or four hours more uh, than men in taking care of children and the household. So um, their roles are usually related to cleaning, washing, um, uh, ironing, uh, making food, uh, taking care of elderly, uh, educational um, attainment of their kids, uh, support and so on. Uh, so um, all these um, uh, roles uh, that they are playing uh, are um, uh, contributing to the different needs they have in terms of um, energy consumption, in terms of um, uh, food supply chain, how they behave. Uh, and uh, all this is very important and contributes to the overall uh, management of the natural resources and can be um, very crucial to uh, how we tackle also climate change. We should not uh, also forget, uh, as uh, Robin was mentioning, uh, that women in Macedonia are still less paid uh, than men. Uh, the latest estimates show that uh, they have 18 to 19 percent difference uh, between um, uh, the um, uh, pay, the salary that men uh, receive uh, uh, as compared to the salary women receive. Uh, and uh, this can contribute uh, contribute um, uh, to uh, future energy poverty if we consider that all of the climate change uh, tackling measures are related to uh, include uh, uh, use of uh, more sustainable energy that will be in principle also more expensive. Uh, so. Um, we should also also know that um, uh, the women uh, uh, can uh, be um, uh, a force uh, that can uh, help um, climate change uh, strive uh, be more effective. Uh, why? Um, uh, because uh, women behave differently in energy consumption, for example. They uh, use energy more sustainably labeled appliances and they have uh, they are willing to change uh, behaviors uh, also women um, have um, uh, acted differently in a role uh, of managers of uh, processes that are crucial for tackling uh, climate change for example i've done uh, last year one study for unido this is the un agency for industry development which showed that, that um, uh, although women are very uh, little uh, represented in this sector uh, when they are managing processes uh, that uh, can uh, um, 
bring us towards uh, energy efficient uh, management, which can contribute to uh, tackling uh, climate change, uh, they have different management styles. They are more persistent, they have soft skills, they have people skills, and uh, these are all uh, contributing to better managing uh, the processes that are uh, leading to more sustainable uh, um, uh, management of the climate change. So women are crucial uh, uh, in both um, uh, being affected by climate change and uh, being an actor that can um, uh, be force uh, that tackles climate change. Yes, thank you. So uh, if I can uh, extract one, maybe one sentence that all three of you had in common from your answers is that these inequalities are deeply rooted in our traditional views of uh, the roles of women in society. So what, in your opinion, is uh, the, the action, the first thing that we need to do in order to kind of, uh, in order for this unequal treatment and the unequal, unequal impact of climate change to change towards women? What, what is the number one thing that, that we all should focus on? Okay. Well, um, if you ask me, uh, I would say that um, one thing that is very um, important is the way how we live. Um, type of living is contributing to climate change and we have to change how we live and how we behave. Uh, and uh, this COVID crisis has shown us that we can uh, make uh, sustainable um, uh, solutions to many uh, problems that uh, contribute to climate change uh, and uh, that uh, how uh, we live. Uh, we have to use this as an opportunity not to see it as um, uh, going to the normal, uh, but to set up, I would say, a new normal for um, behaving and uh, living. Um, I see this new normal uh, in the um, way uh, how we organize life, uh, going back uh, to the villages, to nature, uh, going back to growing our own food, which is actually something that is uh, now uh, conditioned by this um, shortened uh, uh, chain of supply of goods uh, that has uh, been instigated by the crisis. Uh, but also uh, on um, uh, re recycling and uh, uh, using um, a more uh, sustainable uh, energy sources for, um, uh, for heating for, um, uh, and other, uh, other um, purposes. So uh, I think that we should um, uh, use this uh, COVID crisis and as an opportunity to um, to change uh, the modern way of living. Okay, if I may go next. Um, as uh, as I mentioned, the intersectionality approach. Um, I would say that uh, we need to impose the. Uh, intersectional gender anal analysis across all sectors and all, all our actions, policies, plans, planning, organizing, uh, because uh, we need to um, all understand the need and respond the need for gender and reproductive justice and the need for actions that really create a just transformation uh, for our societies. Also, uh, what action is needed in order to create the change, as Robin mentioned uh, before as well, like we need to make sure that women are actively brought in and are, are benefiting from the just transformation that we are all together are going to create. Like uh, that women are, um, are benefiting from the green jobs and social policies that are created. Uh, they have, they are included in the pay equity. They uh, have paid family leave, uh, free childcare. So uh, we need a just transformation that also recognizes and end gender bias, harassment, and violence 
present across all or our institutions and industries. So to recognize and end the sexual violence present in our communities, the, explo the exploitations of our women workers, let's say in the, text the textile industries, that is very much present in our country. So the patriarchal norms in our homes and in our everyday communication and functioning as well. So we need to demand just transformation that holds as I said, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive rights in all circumstances. Um, yeah, no, I think I think um, that was yeah really really strong um, from you, Sophia. And I'm not sure not sure how to how to follow that necessarily. But um, but I what I would say is um, when when we're thinking about how we um, how we kind of deal with the differential impacts of of, of gender. Um, of gender, of climate change on um, on, on 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 men and women, um, we we use the um, the gender action plan, which was agreed at, at kind of COP twenty five, um, as as a bit of a starting point, and it kind of highlights two like kind of really broad objective objectives. So so one of one of those is to uh, enhance the um, participation and leadership of women and girls in in all levels of of climate policy um, making, and the, and the other kind of high level priority is about integrating gender into into kind of climate policies, plans, strategies, and and actions. So I think I think when we're thinking about how we address challenges, we're we're thinking about those kind of two main like areas areas for action so um I, I guess kind of following on from what you were saying Sophia about um kind of making sure that we're empowering women as as leaders and making sure that we are um making making space for kind of ver, ver voices and views and also the kind of views of, of like women's rights organizations as well um and I think just also kind of just engaging a lot with kind of civil society um from from the global south um and, and kind of the NGO community to really, really understand um, like perspectives and, and needs. Um, but also thinking about how that relates to like our domestic climate action. So for example, in the UK, we have um, like targets for women's representation in our renewable energy sectors, um, which is I think um, one, one path towards um, like improving improving kind of gender balance and women's leadership opportunities in in kind of climate sectors, and then on the on the other the other point about kind of integrating gender into into climate action, um yeah just just generally very 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 um obviously very important um and definitely key to think about like gender equality when you're developing a, a project or a program related to related to climate, um but yeah I think I think the the thing is there's not really like a silver bullet. Um, there's not like one thing that'll fix it. Um, I think it requires a lot of action and a lot of different fronts um, in order to like make the make the picture change. Um, yeah. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Um, so if I may, yes, if I may, I think um, we forgot about talking about um, the participation of women in the labor market and in uh, equally in some of the educational fields, which are very important and pertinent for uh, tackling uh, climate change. And here I would uh, actually send messages to all the young people uh, that are uh, participating that uh, we need to uh break the stereotypes about choosing uh, the profession uh, our labor market still is segregated vertically and horizontally um, women are still facing uh, the uh, glass ceiling in terms of being promoted to management positions in some areas uh, but are uh, also um, uh, choosing themselves because of uh, expectations and pressure of society and families, uh, professions which are uh, more related to their gender roles. So uh, we cannot tackle climate change with a gender mainstreamed uh, approach if we don't have women in industry, in energy, uh, if we don't have women in um, environmental management. So we have to encourage young people um, uh, to uh, enroll in, in the studies that will lead them to the uh, jobs in these areas and also to uh, uh, work on uh, breaking the stereotypes among employers uh, to employ uh, young women uh, in uh, the industries we, which are uh, male dominated. 
uh, we would need to involve uh, again here uh, human resource management and overall um, management of the companies to uh, build um, to build environments which are uh, access accept for uh, women uh, to uh, to work uh, and grow in. Uh, of course, uh, uh, these two uh, issues, education and labor market, uh, labor market are interconnected. The latest results show that uh, uh, girls uh, have the same educational results in um, maths and science classes, even they improved over time uh, than uh, boys, uh, which suggests uh, that, uh, but still are not enrolling um, in the same numbers uh, as boys in um, uh, studies, uh, higher education studies in uh, uh, maths um, uh, and sciences and all STEM um, fields, uh, which um, can be problematic because uh, also the technology that we will develop in the future, which is also crucial for tackling climate change, can uh, remain um, gender blind uh, without the perspective of uh, women. Uh, so I think uh, that um, we all should uh, join forces into um, uh, these two very important areas uh, for climate change that we don't see uh, at the first uh, thing um, uh, when we talk about uh, climate change as important, but they are uh, preconditions for successful taking of the crisis. Yes, that was a great insight. Yeah, okay. Uh, Add a direct point to the it was mentioned uh, to the conversation about the domestic climate policies. So there is a debate and argumentation uh, we, within the feminist cycles that um, there is no such thing as domestic climate policies because the climate crisis has been uh, rooted and is happening because of uh, multiple interlinked uh, systems of oppression that are happening on a global level and that we need to, uh, in order to respond to it, we need to understand the differentiated responsibilities between countries and the historic responsibilities as well. So um, yes, I just wanted to add uh, this um, this um, point to, to, to the creating the domestic climate policy. Yes, thank you. Um, I would address the next Robin, since she is, uh, she will give a insight straight from the COP26 unit. Uh, so my question is, and I, um, our guests, women, climate change is important, and some, some may even say that that this inclusion of women in the fight is crucial in combating this issue. So why is that? Um, yeah, no, I, I, would, I would definitely agree with um, if people who, who, who say that the, the kind of role that women have to play in, in climate action is, is critical, crucial, like absolutely, definitely. Um, and I would say that um, like in, in my job, I obviously, um, Think, think a lot about gender and climate change um, and I feel like every every week I speak to um, uh, like female um, leaders or educators or like advocates or activists or like CEOs um, or like program officers like women in a really really kind of diverse variety um, of, of roles um, and I think that's kind of um, incredibly important as I think um, I think Maria you said that if, if women are in those positions then it's more likely that policies and like plans will be delivered in a kind of gender blind way, which is just not what we want. Um, we we want to make sure that that yeah, gender equality is, is accounted accounted for when we're um, yeah think, thinking about how to how to address climate change. And in the um, in the gender action plan, which I, which I've mentioned, it talks about how countries should push towards the full, equal and meaningful participation of, of women and girls and in all levels of, of climate action. And that's definitely, um, yeah, absolutely Im Im imperative. Um, I think kind of those diverse views can help um, to, um, enable kind of like innovative solutions um, and drive kind of better, better outcomes generally. Um, I think there's evidence that can kind of increase 
the economic opportunities available for, for individuals and communities, um, improve kind of management of natural resources um, in the interest of kind of constructing a, a more sustainable and equitable future. But I would, I would also just like lastly add that um, obviously it's incredibly important that um, women are like equally represented um, in, in like all levels of climate action from negotiations that I'm part of to like um, action on the, on the ground. Um, but I think it's also really important that um, it isn't just women talking about gender equality. Um, at most things I go to on gender equality and climate, it is just women. Um, obviously this panel is lovely and um, we're all, we're all um, you know, we're women and we talk about um, gender equality and that's great, but I, I also think it's incredibly important, the, the role of male allies and advocates um, and and that um, gender equality isn't just a thing for um, people who identify as 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 women to think about. Um, yeah, so so that's kind of my my last my last pitch. And I I certainly in, in my job I'm always um, yeah I, I definitely try and push for my male colleagues to talk about gender equality in um, bits of their job. And I think also just like lastly I would say that um, there is a tendency for for gender to be siloed. Um, and to um, be seen as kind of separate um, and not part of other conversations on aspects of climate action. Whereas it's really, really important that when we're talking about adaptation, we talk about gender as well. And when we're talking about, um, I don't know, energy policies, we're talking about gender as well. So yeah, that's, that's my bit. Thanks. If I may, I think that um, women are uh, more vulnerable to energy poverty, for example, and poverty uh, per se, uh, and are very crucial in the food supply chain, but uh, they are not uh, recognized uh, to, uh, the, um, that they have uh, a role in uh, climate change. And this is the first thing uh, we, uh, we should do. Um, they uh, need to be recognized not just uh, as caregivers uh, or house uh, uh, makers, uh, but uh, as um, um, active um, innovators who can um, uh, find uh, ways and solutions because of the role they play in the family and the household uh, to the uh, different problems that contribute to uh, or processes that contribute to climate change. Uh, in this respect, we need them in the decision-making uh, processes, uh, but we need uh, them uh, and their role and their needs uh, to be recognized in uh, the whole chain of uh, policy development to implementation, to monitoring and evaluation, which is something uh, uh, that is uh, um, missing, uh, at least in Macedonia, we are still um, lacking uh, a systemic monitoring and evaluation system uh, that would uh, uh, gather data uh, on um, uh, gender uh, disaggregated basis. Even some of the traditionally um, published um, analysis and reports uh, that are uh, done by state institutions, like, for example, the time use survey um, or um, the um, disaggregation of the data related to salaries uh, are not published for which uh, trend which is frightening someone uh, like this so uh, uh, and um, Innovators and that uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, I would just make a small remark uh, to for for me gender, uh, gender equality field is. Uh, 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 but, but climate change, uh, there was 
uh, in it, uh, uh, it would be all men panel. And because this is a gender and climate change uh, panel, we are all women panel, which is also contributing to uh, the uh, divide that uh, we recognize is problematic and we have to uh, have a more active, uh, uh, proactive role of men in gender equality, but also of uh, mainstreaming women's opinions uh, and perceptions in um, topics which are maybe uh, perceived as uh, male, um, still perceived as male dominated or of male interest. Yes, thank you for your answers. Um, the next question, I, I definitely, I, I'm very interested in uh, hearing from you. And I would like to ask you what what has been your your biggest challenge uh, by far? Something that <clears throat> maybe in in a moment discouraged you from what you're doing, or something that you found very difficult to overcome in this in your journey of uh, gender and women eco activism. Maybe some story, some some situation that you found shocking, and you will, will definitely remember and want to share with other other people. Oh, well, um, I would say that it is very hard to swallow that we are still trying to explain the urgency to act and to change the broken system that we are having um, uh, and that we are facing our, our skin on everyday level. So um, the breaking of the pattern that we, the people, the women of our country, let's say, um, the women in general don't have the power to do so. And the power of resistance when it comes for the betterment for our communities. So the understanding of the obligation to leave this planet better than we found it. So I would say that that's the biggest challenge I have faced so far uh, within, um, within my work. Um, I, yeah, no, if I, I, I think kind of similarly, yeah, I would say that I was just thinking about your request for a story and I'm not sure if I have any, but, um, I was, I was thinking about when I, when I, when I first got my job and I was explaining to my friends, um, what it was I was doing and, um, the fact that it kind of focused on, on like gender and climate change. Um, and I was, I was saying, well, no, there's obviously evidence that, um, Woman, woman and girls are, are kind of disproportionately impacted by, by climate change. And I, I said that, and the amount of, of challenge that I got from my male friends about that fact, despite me having like evidence of, of the kind of differentiated impacts, it was, it was, it was quite staggering. Um, and, and it made me reconsider, um, I guess, not necessarily the friendship, so it just, I don't know, it made, it made me think a little bit. So I think, I think um, a, a challenge that remains is explaining the, essence of this particular problem um, and it can feel a little bit like um, hitting your head against a brick wall repeatedly trying to explain something um, to, to people who aren't necessarily um, getting it but yeah no so that's that's a big challenge that I face still every day both in my kind of personal relationships and in my my working relationships just trying to really underline what the link is and why like my colleagues for example should consider gender in the work that they're doing um, yeah so I think I think that's a kind of big like obvious problem and I think I think another kind of related ish problem that I've, I've faced is to do with um coherence um and um finding the right people to take action forwards on gender in um the, the UK government um so so for example um climate action takes place in lots of different departments um and it's I think been um it's taken quite a lot of work to to get those departments to kind of um see the relevance of, of gender perhaps to the, the work that they're doing. So um, that's also been a challenge. Okay, so um, in my work, I must say that uh, and living in this country, which is quite polarized and uh, politicized, um, the biggest problem uh, is to do policy work uh, is uh, politicization uh, because uh, every government uh, uh, interprets uh, your criticism as uh, if you criticize us, you're against us. 
uh, even if it's very um, productive criticism, which is uh, towards uh, change that would uh, uh, bring uh, good to everyone, uh, not uh, uh, not criticism to change the government, but uh, to, uh, criticism to change the policies, actually. So um, this is the biggest uh, problem that uh, I have faced in every field. Uh, and I must say here uh, in uh, the eco activism also, uh, I see that as uh, one of the problems, uh, but um, uh, I don't see that much uh, in gender equality. So I, I guess that uh, gender and climate change uh, is a, um, is an area where uh, we can find uh, we can find um, uh, um, basis for unification of uh, the different uh, different opinions and perceptions uh, because uh, on gender equality we have uh, built a very good um, understanding between uh, different political parties and they have accepted. Uh, this as um, uh, as an um, um, area where uh, change must uh, happen, and uh, we should that we should work together. So uh, I must say that uh, even in climate mm. change, I see gender and climate uh, change as a area as an opportunity for uh, transformation and uh, uh, and policy change because. Um, uh, gender is an issue which uh, does not receive um, does not receive uh, obstruction or opposition by uh, uh, by any uh, of the political parties. So, I suggest it as a policy uh, opportunity or a window of opportunity for policy advocacy, uh, even on uh, other topics related to uh, climate change, to have a gender approach uh, in it and uh, to, uh, in order not to uh, receive uh, opposition. Mm. Okay. What, in your opinion, is the the, the second maybe the greatest challenge um, concerning uh, regarding gender and climate change here in our country? Constitutionary and racism. Sustainable economic production patterns, <laughs> but from my personal experience and from my current work, uh, uh, it has been a challenge to include everyone so we can all work together across all set sectors. I believe it's going to be the challenge, so on, like uh, to include to, to include everyone from the civil society, the government, the businesses, in order to inspire collective movement for just transformation of our system. Uh, but I, we are seeing it, and we, we should all see it, see it as a start to keep and demand working together. Because only like this, we have the most, the biggest capacity to change for better future for the generations to come. Yes, thank you. Um, I would. I think I will end this panel discussion. It, it's really great to hear your opinions, your experience. So I know a lot of my friends, colleagues who realize the urgence of climate change and are aware that women are still not uh, treated equally, are not impacted equally with this crisis. So maybe uh, each and every one of you can give can send a message can give an advice to young women who are who have ambitions who really want to make a change in our society nowadays what would your message to them be what what should they do what should they avoid doing three things find good um, um, advocates that you will work with partners in advocating the change uh, never give up uh, because um, that is life. You sometimes fail and sometimes succeed, but when you succeed, it's very, very good feeling and uh, you will be very proud of yourself. 
Um, and three, you're not doing this just for yourself, but for uh, the generations to come. And we have one planet to save and um, uh, your role is equally important as everyone else. Okay, um, what I would say uh, in order to inspire and be motivational is like uh, get together with other women, create allyships, talk about it, talk about what's wrong around you, comfort the societal norms that are imposed on us, understand the ways we have been all molded by the patriarchy, listen to each other, learn from each other, share practices, connect with other communities and connect with those who have been excluded, uh, whose voices have been silenced. Um, so build a mo movement, uh, really build a movement that centers on solidarity, justice, equity, sustainability, principles, uh, common values, uh, common visions uh, and um, respect for one another, respect for the nature and its ecosystems, and as well like respect uh, for all the living beings around us. And uh, as the end, I would say um, the first step is um, to search the internet, take the time to read, to research and get information. There are plenty of resources, toolkits, podcasts, Instagram stories as well, like they ha that have been very helpful to me. Uh, and I can also share with you what I found as well, like links to those resources. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much I have to, to add to either of those, apart from raising that I definitely agree. Um, and I think that, yeah, no, definitely like allyship um, and creating like communities is, is, is really, really key, I think. You, we learn so much from um, just speaking to others who are, who are already doing work in this space or who haven't been included in, in this space yet. Um, I think I think that's really, really important. And I think, yeah, it's generally another message would be like, well done for all your work, but also definitely keep going. Um, and I think also um, definitely keep asking questions and keep challenging um, because it's only by like asking questions of people like me, a policymaker or I guess like politicians, like that will engender change um so yeah just keep asking keep asking the questions and asking the right questions so yes definitely in my opinion women and girls nowadays should be a hundred times more confident in themselves they underestimate their power their knowledge what they can contribute to any place that they go to and Maybe, maybe we can finish with one additional question, which I really want to know is, is there something that since you have experience in this, in this area, what, what is something that you wish someone told you when you started, when you began your, let's say, your fight against um, gender inequality and climate change? Is there some advice that you wish someone told you, like, be more confident or do this? Um, I'll just go really quickly. Someone did tell me this. Um, I, um, when I was in, I think in one of my first kind of international negotiations, I, um, I was very a bit, a bit nervous and didn't speak as much as I perhaps should have. And, and my, my boss at the time said to me, he was like, um, you know, that you, you wouldn't, we wouldn't have put you in there if we didn't have faith in your ability to like convey a message. So, um, yeah, I think I think maybe maybe to apply that to other people, um, I guess there's probably a reason why you're in the position that you are, or um, or in the room that you're in, and so have have confidence in in that, like someone put you there for a reason. Um, yeah. I would share a one uh, Instagram picture that I saw recently, and it says, uh, "Be the person no one expects you to be." And yes, I would I would say that advice I really needed to hear. Yeah, that's very, very inspiring message, I think. Yeah. 
Well, I, I would say that um, people should, um, <laughs> this is my son, um, uh, people should uh, actually uh, never, um, uh, not just give up, but um, uh, ju uh, also adapt uh, the uh, approaches they have uh, applied in their work, uh, especially when advocating for change, because not always one approach is, um, uh, will Will get you to the desired result. Uh, please innovate and try out different approaches. Uh, be, um, um, as uh, Sophia says, uh, unexpected. Uh, and always remember, if you are not uh, understood by the person that uh, you talk to, uh, there is always a person above him or her that might uh, understand your uh, arguments, uh, especially if they are well grounded and uh, backed up with data. Uh, so uh, always uh, shoot for uh, the ones that make the decisions. Uh, don't get stuck in the bureaucratic uh, labyrinths uh, of uh, our country, which are many. <laughs> yes, I 100% agree with you. That's great advice for everyone here listening and wanting to maybe do big things in the future. I would like to thank uh, all of you for contributing greatly to this panel discussion today. Um, I hope that you have a lovely evening. Um, if you have anything to add, feel free to do so. And that, that would be it for me today. Thank you. Um, both of you were amazing and also you, Matea. So uh, well done. I was really happy to be part of this of this uh, panel discussion. I'm very happy to meet you um, and uh, to uh, have participated. I uh, am um, actually looking forward uh, to some questions, <laughs> maybe uh, from uh, the people who are following uh, the discussion, uh, because um, I guess uh, they also have uh, a lot of ideas uh, and issues to raise. Uh, but I'm very happy always to support uh, youth in um, gender equality and other transformational uh, issues um, that will improve quality of life in our country. Um, and, and yeah, just for me, uh, th thank you so much for um, yeah, chair chairing such a, such, a, such a good and uh, I think inform informative uh, discussion. Um, and it's been, it's been a great panel to be a, a part of. Yes. Thank you. I really hope that we, we, we can meet as soon as possible in person and share a lot more stories, a lot more experiences. And right at the end, I would like to thank the British Embassy for initiating and helping us organize this panel discussion, as well as Go Green. Um, greetings to you as well. I uh, hope you all have a lovely day. And since we don't have any questions in the chat, I, I do believe that. Um, the participants were pretty satisfied with the discussion that we had today. So have a great evening, guys, and I hope I will see you in the future, in the near future. Bye. Bye. Have a good rest of the day. You too.